Hello everyone, welcome to The Orbit, and today I'm going to answer a question from Sarah M. Sarah emailed me through remotelyinteresting.work and asked, Hello Connor, how would you balance being a multi-interested person? I would say that music is my number one thing, but is it trying to do more than I can handle by wanting to do an additional business or pursuing another interest while doing music as well as keeping my part-time job? Or would it be best to just focus on one project business thing at a time? Thank you again. All the best, Sarah. This is a good question because I feel like I'm in the same boat a lot of the times. I want to do everything and I don't have the time to do everything. So we're going to talk about jam. Some of you may have heard of the jam experiment. And what went down is there was this storefront and they had maybe a hundred different jams that customers could choose. Customers would walk in, peruse the selection, maybe buy something and leave. What they found is that when customers had too many jams to choose from, they ended up not picking any because they were overwhelmed. They followed up by having a storefront that only had like five or 10 jams to choose from. And it turns out when there was a smaller selection, it was significantly easier to choose and they saw a sale increase of something like 20%. You can look up the study to find out the details, but the main takeaway is that if you have too many choices, you will have choice paralysis and not pick any of them. If you have a smaller sample size, a smaller uh, collection of things to choose from, you are more likely to make the leap and to make a purchase. I saw this firsthand in my time at Paddles. I worked in libraries and bookstores for a lot of my like adolescent life and it culminated in working at Paddles City of Books in Portland, Oregon. One of the most common things that we heard from customers was that the bookstore was overwhelming. Fair, it's four stories, you have a couple million volumes of books and it's easy to get lost inside of the store. It's hard to know where to even start. <laughs> So what we did, because we knew it was overwhelming and also overwhelm prevented sales, we provided a bunch of tools to make the selection smaller, one of which was shelf talkers. If you've ever been in the bookstore, you've seen those little notes that tell you what the book is about or if it's a staff pick. It helps you take a shelf and narrow your selection. Also, we made bookmarks that had lists of books we recommended. So if you were... In middle school and into sci-fi, we had a bookmark that had a list of books that would probably be something you're into. Lastly, we had excellent customer service. Pretty much everyone I worked with was a book enthusiast. I think that was on the job description. You have to love books. So if you talk to anyone in the store and say, I don't know where to start, they're probably gonna be stoked to help you find the section where you belong. Uh, for me, my specialty was young adult fiction. Uh, specifically like young adult sci-fi and I would help people find books about tech for teenagers. The moral here is that if you have an overwhelming selection and in this case Sarah this is your selection of things you could potentially do with your time what you got to do is make that list a little bit more manageable and then you'll be more likely to do something instead of not doing anything because you can do everything. So let's talk about picking a career. As a wee lad, I realized that I could do anything that I wanted. People told me at a very young age, hey, like, hey, you can do whatever you want. And it, I didn't know what to do with this information. Now also have the internet, which says, hey, if you want to learn something, you can pretty much learn anything. What are you going to do? And so I quickly got overwhelmed and was trying to figure out, well, I'm interested in everything. What am I going to do? There's a couple things to understand from the get-go. First, Cheyenne reminds me of this all the time, you have many lifetimes to live. You will potentially have the time in your life to try a bunch of different things. So relax and know that you will have chapters to explore your interests. Second, start with one. And picking that one is an incredibly difficult process. So I'm gonna provide a framework. This isn't like the main framework, but this is one way to make your big list very small. First of all, start with a big list because it's better to have too many ideas than too few. And the reason here is that if you have a lot of ideas of where you want to spend your time, write out all the potential areas 
that you could. Seems counterintuitive because of the like selection problem, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a big list and then make that list smaller based on our goals and values. So once you have a big list of all the things you wanna do, for me, it would look something like direct a movie, write a book, learn how to code properly, uh, do some capture the flag competitions online, get fit. <laughs> Uh, there would just be maybe 25 to 30 things. Could be more. First, look at the past. What are some things that you've done before and knew you liked? What are things that you're good at? What is your expertise? If you look at the past and use it as kind of like a way to, to see your trajectory in retrospect, you will see much clearer paths of where you want to go. Looking back, I realized a lot of my favorite jobs were working in bookstores and libraries. And the reason I liked it was because I liked talking about a lot of different subjects. And bookstores and libraries allowed me to talk about a ton of different subjects and also read a bunch of books about them. Looking at the past can clarify, oh, I see patterns now. Patterns that you may have not have noticed when you were doing the thing. But once you plot out, oh, this is what worked, this is what didn't, you may be able to cross out some things from your idea list. Secondly, ask yourself, what can I do today? My sister and I operate on the Benjamin Franklin work schedule, which you can Google, and Benjamin Franklin outlined hour by hour what he does almost every single day. Something broke in the apartment. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, every morning would ask himself, what is, what is some good that I can do today? And then at the end of the day, he would ask himself, what good have I done today? When I say that to myself, I realize one of the most important words in there is can. What can I do? What good can I do today? When I ask myself, what can I do today? I, it's asking myself, what do I have? <laughs> what can I reasonably expect to do without having to like get more materials or expertise? and it gives me a place to start. Because there are certain things, if you look at your list, you'll realize, oh, I can't do that today. For example, if you wanted to learn how to drive very fast, you would need a car and a place to drive really fast. I have neither. I don't even have a driver's license. Ask yourself what can you do today in a really realistic sense, and it'll help you call your list even further. Lastly, we've looked at the past, we looked at the present, time to look at the future. What are your short-term and long-term goals? If you sit and think about the things that are important to you, or if you imagine where you would like to be in the future, maybe it's running a successful shop, maybe it's running a marathon, maybe it's having a successful music career. If you visualize what you want to accomplish, the tasks at hand become clearer. It's like what people do when they make you know, their vision boards, or it's the whole premise of the secret. It's all about identifying your goals and values because then the paths present themselves. Ask yourself, what can I do today and which one of these things on my list will bring me closer to my long-term goals or my short-term goals? Look at the past, look at the present, look at the future, but ultimately trust your gut. Adam Savage is an obsessive creative. I remember watching him on YouTube and he just, just showed a list of all the projects that he wanted to do. And he said, I always have ideas for projects and I never know which one to do. So what he does is just sometimes will close his eyes and pick one. If you're at a loss or if you still have a ton of things to choose from, that might be your best best or choose the one that just seems like the best one you want to do. Ultimately, picking something is better than not picking anything at all. I think about it like food because at any given time, I'm craving something. Last night, I was craving sushi. And if you listened to just what you want intuitively in your gut, follow that. Use that also as a factor in culling your list. Once you start picking stuff, set a deadline because I find that if you pick a project and set too lofty of a goal, it goes on forever and then you never finish it. And then now you don't have a list of things you want to do, you have a list of things that you attempted and then stopped doing. The way you tackle this is to set reasonable goals and deadlines. If you finish stuff, you could then put a little bow on it, 
put it in your portfolio and use it as another like experiment that taught you something for where you want to go to next. If I'm gonna talk about code, I can do an assortment of code projects. A lot of them I start and don't finish, but the ones that I finish on a deadline on like my weekend code projects, I then can put into a portfolio and say, hey, here's a working thing. It's not perfect. It's I definitely probably could have done a better job, but it's done and it works. If you can't commit to a month long project, try a week long project or a weekend project. By setting a deadline that is achievable, you can finish a thing and then show it off and use it as a springboard for your next thing. One of the people that I think does this really well is Darius Kazemi. Online, he has an alias, Tiny Subversions, and Darius Kazemi makes bots. He makes a lot of like weird internet art projects. And there are so many of them that he actually keeps a Google sheet to keep track. If you go to his website, Tiny Subversions, I click on projects and he has such a long list of things. Like looking at it, there's are at least a hundred projects that he's done here. And as an obsessive creative person, I love this because I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do something similar, I can make a ton of projects, I can finish them, put them in a Google sheet and then show like a client, look how creative I am. Look how many projects of different subjects scopes, tools, look how diverse my project range is and look how prolific I am because I finished these things. To go back to Sarah's question of how do you balance being a multi-interested person? Maintain your interests, make a big list, and then for each day, for each week and month, try to make a smaller selection of what you're going to accomplish and then do it. Balancing being a multi-interested person is making the unmanageable manageable. It's taking a large selection and making it a selection of maybe five jams. Then you will start making small steps in your career, small achievements that will ultimately culminate in a demonstration. A demonstration that you are knowledgeable, interested, and creative in a variety of fields. If you're curious, I'm gonna put some links to the jam experiment. And if you have a question, feel free to email me at remotelyinteresting.work. Hopefully this was useful and I will see you next time.